Well, a very good afternoon to all my friends. Like, and the mic. Friends, I see. Mic, mic. I think I'm adorable. Audible. 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 So uh, today we are, like, I have an immense privilege that I have been given this platform. So I'm a, so though there is less crowd, but I think I could say whatever I wanted to say. Okay. So the topic is theatre and the cultural exchange. So whenever we see say cultural exchange, so it's like first we must know because as I'm a student of theatre studies, I'm pursuing my PhD. So initially, it was a like, theatre studies is like a very new subject. Uh, initially, people used to think that you know English literature and theatre studies that we could march there are the same, but it's here and there difference like economics and statistics. There's a fine line. So uh, initially, while dealing with this particular cultural exchange, I came across two terms. One is intercultural. And one is intracultural, interculturalism and intraculturalism. So, what's the difference between intracultural and intercultural? Inter means I am in India. If I am studying a text, say of Ibsen, Ibsen was a was a Norwegian author, or maybe Shakespeare. Okay. So, if I am in India. Translating a text of Shakespeare or adapting the text of Shakespeare to my local language. Say I am a Bengali, so in Bengali I am translating it. If I am just doing a literal translation, what to what translation? If it is a If I am translating a text, a British text, to Indian, uh, like uh, in my local language, so this is just a literal translation. Interculturalism is not directly taking place. But if I am a translator, I will try to translate it with my own feelings. We can't escape the fact. Now, if I am adapting the text. Like if I am doing an adaptation, then my socio-economic background will also be considered. Now, in that fashion, interculturalism takes place. So, a text, a Shakespearean text, maybe Macbeth or maybe Hamlet. When I am doing it in Bengal, I am just making it little local. I am making Hamlet as Himlat, Prince of Denmark. I am making him Prince of Goranhata. An imaginary state of Bengal, and what? And it had it had been like done by Rakta Bhushu, who is our one of the ministers, the cabinet in our state. So what's the difference? Hamlet saw his father's ghost. Now in the adaptation, Hamlet's son is talking to his grandfather. Okay, so it's a like they have uh, prepared it accordingly. So this is primarily it's called interculturalism, Indian culture and British culture. Okay, how a particular text has been translated and adapted to suit the Indian audience. Okay, and the context is very important. In West Bengal, we are having a right wing. Oriented uh, politicians, you must be doing. And in the year 1977, when we got, the, when the entire transition took place and the entire power of Bengal went to the left government, few texts were taking places. Like Utpadat is one of the premier uh, writers of those days. So after like he translated and. <coughs> He even wrote few texts just to give a transformation in the political scenario. So that that will come later on. So this is primarily called interculturalism. A British text become a Bengali text, and all same author, different backgrounds, 
different audience, different colors, different locales. Now, next we are coming to the intraculturalism. What is intraculturalism? Again, I am coming back to Bengal. Okay. We all know that the mother tongue of Bangladesh is also Bengali or it's Bangla. Okay, it's not Bengali, it's Bangla. Okay. So, Bangla in West Bengal is also Bangla. We call it Bengali. So, two states having same mother tongue, Bengali and Bangla. But, West Bengal or Bengal is dominated by the Hindus, mostly, and Bangladesh is having an Islamic culture. If I am saying uh, like water in Bengali as jol means water, the same thing the Bangladeshis will say pani. It's also Bengali. Okay, so a single text, say I am taking as I am working on Samuel Beckett, Beckett's reception, uh, like Beckett between cultures, reception of Samuel Beckett in the theatres of India. So, there I found like one text, suppose waiting for Godo. Waiting for Godo is getting adapted in Bengal as Ishwar Babu Aschen. Ishwar means God. Ishwar Babu Aschen means coming. God is coming. So, waiting for Godo. Waiting for Godo is one of the most famous texts of Samuel Beckett. One why it has been translated and adapted. Same text in Bangladesh is been Godor Pratikhai. Godo Pratikhai means waiting. So, in the, either of that, like, you know, is go, waiting for Godo, but in, in same Bengali language, both of them have like have been given two different names. Ishar Babu Aschen or Godor Pratikhai. Okay. Now, why the uh, entire text is getting performed on the stage, the entire thing is different. The way Estragon and Plasin with the characters were really, the way they were uh, given their attires. We all know about the Lungi culture, Lungi people were. So the characters were at the, wearing those. In Bengal, they were wearing pajamas, okay? A same text. So one text in Bengali is getting adapted and translated, not translated, getting adapted, keeping in mind just the cultural difference, but having the same mother tongue. It's called intraculturalism. Okay. Now, this is precisely the basis of interculturalism and intraculturalism. Now, why this cultural exchange is, get, is taking place? Like why at all it's there? We have enough writers, we have enough Indian writers where we can like easily, uh, we can take their texts and we can easily stage them. But in doing so, we are taking care of another culture. We are just taking it as our own culture, we are modifying it with our own understanding of the director and the translator or the, the person who is doing the adaptation. So one text, if I am borrowing it from, suppose Norwegian's The Doll's House, it's very famous. Shobhu Mitro, uh, he had produced it in number of times, uh, like Putul Khala, uh, A Doll's House by uh, Henry Ibsen. Shobhumutra adapted it way back in 50s, 1950s and it was still now the, in the Bengali text, Putul Khala. It is now been one of the major texts and people are working on it as a part of their PhD project. So, Henry Gibson is nowhere, just in the essence. Now, Shobhumutra's Putul Khala has become a text for PhD, uh, like a very uh, prominent, uh, promising topic for the PhD goals. So in that particular text, the character Nora, there's a character called Nora, is, as you're doing uh, like all these things, you're part of the human empowerment. In the, in the original text, Nora, she, she, was, she was asked to leave, but in Kutul Khala, Nora didn't go anywhere. 
So there was kind of women empowerment, and the more we are staging that play, the more we are empowering Nora with our own understanding. Number two is that uh, as I've taken uh, waiting for Godo, in waiting for Godo, two men, Estragon and Vladimir, they were waiting for a person called Godo. Okay, who is Godo? People are saying that Godo is G O D, God. So God means you know. So that that person must be a Bhagwan or go dot dot means the center, you know, and stars. Now, I did my infill with the concept of male friendship. Two men they were waiting for a person called Godo. So why only two men? If Godo is a god, then even both of us can wait for Godo. Even a girl and a boy also can wait for Godo, but it's two men. They were waiting for Godo. They come. They were contemplating suicide, everything. But end of the play, they were not moving. They are still waiting for Godo. So I gave a version of it that maybe the because Samuel Beckett wrote it during the Second World War. So many male friendships were happening during the war. Maybe. In today's world, is the two men? Is there friends? Is there more than a friends? We automatically falling under the category of you know uh, we have to uh, seek legal uh, help for that. So if both of them are waiting for Godo, then Godo may be the social approval about their friendship, okay? And Godo may be. That impossible, that that medical thing, that uh, for uh, for an impossible part out of two men. So Godo can be anything. It, it, it can have a open ending. So this is how cultural thing is happening. And theatre and again theatre and cultural exchange also is taking place uh, in our mind. Again, I'm raising the question: Why at all we are going abroad and getting their text? Why not we are here? Why, why, why can't we are here and we are accepting our local authors? Like we have Rabindranath, we have Mahesh Dattani, but still we are falling for Shakespeare, Ibsen, and there are other authors like Samuel Beckett and all. So I was talking to Meena Ji just now that you no, know, she will be taking over the. Holistic development through theater, ma'am. Like after your, you know, speech, I might do a sum up so that I can also get some of my answers. Like why this is happening? Yes, sure. Over two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Priyadi. I am Meena Baluja, and I am from Hanging Hand Workshops. As my name is not there on the screen because I was informed today itself, just one hour back, that you have to take a session. So I'm totally coming unprepared, but whatever I speak, I'll be speaking from my heart. Theatre, theatre is one of my pet projects, and theatre, because we all are, as Shakespeare has said, that this world is a stage, and we all are puppets. We all are actors. This is what I believe in. Wherever we go, whichever role we play, we are acting. Have you not? We play the role of a mother. I have to change my role. If I'm playing the role of a wife, I have to change my role. If I'm playing the role of my sister-in-law, then I have to change my role. My tone, my behavior, my dialogues, my modulation, my personality, my thought process, everything will change. I cannot be a sister and a mother at the same time. Can I be? Can we have two roles together? Think about it. Did you get any chance in life where you are playing two roles together? Yeah. Where? And when? Every day. Can you be a mother and a sister together? Yes. Yes. Yeah. When? How? No, but then can can you speak the same dialogues? What you are what you are speaking? The can you speak them simultaneously together? Oh, no, 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 no,
you one mean, time, like you one have time, to be one yes, time or the other. Yes, yes. Because see, what happens is, and this is what the beauty of theatre is. Theatre is imbibing the personality. Imbibing the what does the mother say? What is imbibing? Did you not get it? What is imbibing? Can anyone tell? अपने अंदर absorb करना, अपने अंदर absorb करना, absorption सी, हमारा mind एक sponge की तरह है, हमारा mind किसकी तरह है? Sponge की तरह, sponge को अगर पानी पे रख दोगे तो क्या होगा? What happens? It absorb as much as it can, और उसकी maximum capacity तो वो बहुत जाएगा, तो इस sponge का हम क्या करते हैं? What do we do? Squeeze, and what comes out? Does the volume remain the same? No. No? It increases or decreases? Decreases. Decreases. Where does the rest of the water go? Inside the sponge. Inside the sponge. जो हमारे सब conscious mind में चला जाता है, हमारा mind एक sponge की तरह है। आपको classroom में आपके teacher ने पढ़ाया, right? और teacher ने पढ़ाया वो आपने absorb किया। और जब आपकी टीचर ने टेस्ट लिया तो स्क्वीज किया जितना आप स्क्वीज कर सकते थे किया बाहर आके बोलते हैं और ये तो रह गया ये तो मैं भूल ही गई इसको ऐसे कि ऐसे करके लिखना चाहिए था I should have used this I should have written my answer in that particular manner what is that they left out which you could not write and it is still there you have not forgotten it but the way and manner of writing it you must not have followed and this is what the roles in theatre is. Generally what happens is, every role has some demands. Demands of what? Demands of his own culture. Whether it is a Hindi play, whether it is a Tamil play, whether it is a English play, any language play, your Russian play, Shakespearean play, any play you are doing, any, any text you are adopting, you have to follow its norms. Then only the beauty of the play will come out. And that is what is there. If you see about Shakespearean plays, the kind of costumes which are required, the kind of stage which is required. If you talk about Russian plays, the kind of costumes which are required. Are they similar? No, they are different. And if you talk about Princhan, if you talk about um, Satyajitre, if you talk about anybody else, even that also changes. So we have to change as for the need and demand of the role, the character, as well as the beauty of it lies in it. And this is what is there in theatre and cultural exchange. And this is what I request with all the schools generally to teach the children about what theatre is actually. Because it helps in the personality grooming also. It helps in enhancing your own spirituality as well. It helps in your own increase of knowledge also of different cultures. It helps in the learning of different challenges a character plays. You are putting yourself in those shoes of the characters and thinking about it. That if I, Meena would have been like that, how would I have taken the decisions? It may be fiction, it may not be fiction. But decision making, thought process is going on. So you, we have to relate it with our personality as well. And this personality grooming is the best medium which you can do from this theatre. So during theatre workshops, whenever they are, they are organized, these are the certain things which are taught to the children. And the children and these children, when they understand the beauty of it, they are able to relate this in their lives. And I request all the parents and all the teachers and all the students as well to surely join the theatre workshops as and when they get the chance to do it. Have you attended any of the theatre workshops? So what did you learn? So we are, we are in the name of 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 the name
you, you are awaiting the results. Yeah. Great. Did you? We will let you know. We have few uh, friends. Yes. Uh, so, uh, like, if you really get a chance, much really enjoy that. Have you ever got a chance to attend any of these theatre workshops? Actually, I have a very close friend who is into theatre, and mm -hmm. she does a lot of plays in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. And I look at her, and I'm, I just tell her that, how can you do it? I end up laughing. So, can I? really try and get into theatre, me, somebody who ends up laughing and I can't really pay attention and I'm all stuck, what am I going to say on stage? So for somebody like me, what would you suggest, like how yes. can I get into theatre? Theatre is like, see, there are two things, you're already playing a role yourself in your real life. So what are you scared of? The stage. The stage. And stage is, this world is a stage. You have come to WA, this is a game of stage. Right? Your home is a stage itself. The work area where you work is a stage itself. Only difference is, there you are on a podium, you are on a stage, you are in a theatre background, where you have a backdrop. That is only difference. Right? Point is, where we are and what we are trying to enhance. See, theatre acting. Theatre acting gives you insight into your own personality, into your shortcomings, into your good things, into your weaknesses, into your strengths. It gives you a control of your inner self. The eye movements, the body movements, that is what you do in yoga and meditation. What do you do in meditation? What do you do in your aerobics? What do you do in your gym? You control yourself. You learn to control yourself. And that is what you are doing in your theatre. You're learning to control yourself, holding your voice, giving a pause, stating a dialogue. That is what is controlling yourself. So you are just learning the same thing, but in a different scenario. You're doing the same thing, but on a different stage. That's the only difference. Point is, am I learning something out of it? Yes. What am I scared of? So many people sitting around me. As it is, when you are working in an office, you have so many employees sitting in front of you. When you are not scared of employees, why are you scared of your audiences? So that fear automatically comes down when you are holding yourself and your inner fear. So it gives you an insight. And the best part is, you learn to appreciate. See, in the schools, what we are missing is teaching our children to develop aesthetic sense. And that is what is much required, to appreciate music, to appreciate language, to appreciate poetry. What is happening in schools is, English is taught as a subject. Whereas it is not a subject, it is a medium. Hindi is taught in the schools as a subject, whereas it is not a subject, it is a medium. A poet wrote something, from his perspective, point of view, and why do we have to muck it up? There is no point in getting it mucking it up. Why not we take it as a theatre? Why not we take it as a recitation? Why not we take it as a beautiful orientation of expression? And that is what acting should be. It should be taught in a different perspective totally. And that is what is cultural exchange. Cultural for Doing the cultural exchange, we don't have to go to that particular country, no. We can do it over here in our four walls as well. Point is how we want to do it. Point is how we want to reach out to our children. Point is how and what we want to teach our children. And that is what the beauty of theatre drama is. Theatre drama is connect from heart to it is attaching yourself to the roots, grassroots. It is taking you to a different world altogether where, what is happening? Where you are learning about different people, you are learning about different culture, you are learning about different backdrops, you are learning about different era, you are learning about different stories and such. Take them as stories. What is history? I can mention that history is not history, history is high story. What is history? It's a story of the past. Yes. Abhar Ashwabhi hai. 
अब वो तो थे पहले और फिर वो चले गए हम पढ़ रहे हैं अकबर को तो हम क्या पढ़ रहे हैं अकबर की स्टोरी तो पढ़ रहे हैं एक तरह से सो इट इज नॉट हिस्ट्री आई टेल माई चिल्ड्रेन हिस्ट्री इज नथिंग बट हाई स्टोरी हाई टू योर स्टोरी हाई अकबर हाई जहांगीर हाई नूजान हाई चाणकिन यू हैव टू से हाई टू देर एंड सी हाउ ब्यूटिफुल इट इम एंड दिस इज वॉट आई वॉन्ट माई टीचर्स टू लर्न दिस इज वॉट आई वॉन्ट माई पेरेंट्स टू अंडरस्टैंड Please do not make any topics so dull and drab, boring, so that it becomes very difficult for a child to understand. But check out the history you book. Have you already been to the bar yet? It happens. Yes or no? It happens. Yes. Th- those who believe in it, raise your hands and say yes. Loudly. Yes, too. As loud as I as you can. Yes. Why? Why are you running away from me? Why don't we say hi to it? Hi. Hi. The moment we start saying hi to it, we start enjoying it, and that is what is happening. Is why not we make somebody an Akbar? Why not we make somebody a Nur Jahan? Why why not we make you know turn that story into something very interesting? And that is what happening is. Theatre doesn't have to be on the stage every time. Theatre can be a classroom that can be converted into a theatre beautifully. So once we start doing it, only thing is. Has to be in a different perspective, and that is what I believe. As a teacher trainer, I am a teacher trainer by profession, and this is what I generally train my teachers to do: make your topics, make your subjects, make your concepts so interesting in such a manner that everybody starts saying hi to that, not start running away from that. And that is what I want to say in this cultural exchange: every concept, every topic. Be it science, be it mathematics, be it your English, be it your Hindi, any subject in school you are learning, even modern science. Modern science should never be the lecture method. Anything which is done in the lecture method becomes boring, and no one wants to read it. So the lecture mode should be removed at all, completely. New ways and means should be devised so that it becomes easy for them to understand. Complex. Complexity, complex notions. मुझे नहीं अच्छी लगती तो मैं कैसे कैसे बता? Even I, I run away from that. I think इसको simple करो, very very language, very level पे आ जाओ. I can very easily understand. So this is what I want to bring theater into school curriculum. And this is what I want to bring changes in the school. And I know I'll be able to do it if I have such good people with me. With me. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minati, for enlightening all of us, and that was really beautiful. Thank you. So mine was little academic, and ma'am was little, you know, holistic, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. High story. Thank you. Kind of because I used to run away with whenever I'm coming, like you know, when I'm in front of history <laughs> book, and why is it okay? Akbar has built an empire, Mughal empire, Babur, Akbar, and why I am learning? What will How it will help me? What will I do with it? But after your talk, I really feel that I should again go back and read those books. I'll say hi to it and hi to it. <laughs> so this is precisely the theater exchange. And what I do believe that you know why actually this? Well, I was sitting there. I was trying to figure out the answer. Like why actually this play, these texts are getting adapted and translated? You know to give more value. Value to the relation which we are having one to one. Maybe, uh, as Nam said, that you know, in Shakespeare, in Shakespearean plays, we are having long costumes. It's different. Whenever we are doing a text on our independence, so you are thoughty or something like that. It's different. But end of the day, we all are human. Maybe we look different. Maybe I'm black. They're white. Whatever it is. But end of the day, we all have same emotions and sentiments. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, theater is just an execution of our soul, which is which is driven by our society. You know, maybe okay. Priyanka Chatterjee in Delhi and Priyanka Chatterjee in Europe, Priyanka Chatterjee in Kolkata, same person but with different way of looking at life, because we are. in a society which is also driving us at times 
it drives us crazy. At times, it gives us a lot of good memories. Okay. So another thing, those who want to do some workshop, those who are based in Delhi, so there is a group called Chhao Theatre Group. You can write Chhao Theatre Group, Yamant Rajpuriya. Okay. So they have done waiting for Goro for the kids, and they are doing it really good. And um, you all know uh, the person who acted as the principal at Tarun Dhamipur in Kerala is a very good theatre artist. So uh, please take his number and please take my name that you will want. You know, you can uh, you want to do some workshop with him, and you also can contact Dan Hussain, Danis Hussain. Of Hoshuga repertory. So these are the few uh, theatre groups those who are actually conducting Dan Hussein. So you can go to those places and take my name that we are going to send us. So and they will uh, every now and then when they are conducting some theatre workshops. So those who are you are young minds you love those workshops. Just I even I let, let them know that you know you people might contact them. Okay, so we are ending our session here. So, if there is any question, any questions, anybody would like to ask anything? Thank you so much, and I'm really happy that you are having these kids as our yeah, audience. I'm, I'm pleased to have the kids here. Yes. So, you also have the kids? No. Actually, I'm working on Samuel Dutton's reception. So, uh, you know what I do? I have prepared one 15 question. Like, uh, I have prepared one questionnaire. At the end of the Play, I just go to the green room, I sit with the director and the actors, and then I keep on asking them those questions. I write, I record, and then I transfer it from stage to page. So how this is precisely I'm doing. How yes. long does it take for one adaptation to be It depends, like uh, how exactly I'm working, like even how lackadaisical I am. Uh, like it's, at times I do get lazy. But it's like technically, I what I do, I record the entire play. Then I go with my questionnaire. I ask them, like you know, why they have adapted it. What are the changes they have made? Why those changes are taking place? Like what are the reaction of the audience? Questions of that sort. Then I try to, you know, I there are few uh, theories of actress studies, the hourglass model, and it's the, how the one text is you know, getting filtered and become a text of the local. So all the theory I apply and then I come up with my chapters. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. So we are done with the next. Oh, we are a this with you. Can I have a group photo? Uh, a group photo please, let's come for a group photo. Please come. Okay, Thank you, thank you. Black. Yeah. Oh, so many hands are Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's topic is giving and philanthropy, the social enterprise case studies. For this, we have an esteemed panel, Emlyn Kumanula from Malawi and Vijay Lakshmi from India. So uh, let me hand over the mic with Emlyn, which is going to start. It is a pleasure to be here. Mm. Before I start, I would like to Mike, greet everyone present in this room. As the Minister of Master of Senior Project has already uh, introduced, uh, the topic picture we discussed is about giving and for being social enterprises. Uh, the idea is that non profit business venture can create positive social impact while operating with reference to the international economy. Social enterprise explains that it is an important corporate tool to create job opportunities for the disadvantaged, homeless, and other at risk and other at risk people. A good example are projects implemented by Counterpoint Alliance for Partnership under a grant from U.S. agency for international development and ensure it's called the U.S. These are the inputs included projects. Business trainings, loans, legal advice, the other example could be the Peace Beauty Culture Association. This is a tour founder, creative workshop, produce and sell ex exclusive clothes for children and youth using natural fibers decorated with traditional Ukrainian art and contemporary designs. The revenue collected from the deposits is channeled to promote national pride, culture, arts in schools, train youth in sustainable job skills, and very important interventions as we are heading to the culture of creativity and innovation. I wish to share you with another dimension of giving. In shaping the agenda for gender mainstreaming and building sustainable co communities, I feel I should talk about the energy sector. In the spirit of giving, Economically empowered women create healthier, more sustainable societies. We could not discuss meaningful economic empowerment issues in isolation of the energy sector. In the majority of regions, a bigger percentage of population is not connected to the electricity grid. And this is a fact. This being the case, their energy requirements, they derive their energy requirements from biomass, firewood, charcoal, and other sources. In the areas where population is rising at a high rate, these practices put pressure on water, forests, in order to meet the ever-growing needs of the population. Having said that, some case studies are in place. The biogas energy. In some families, they have a reasonable number of livestock 
it may be ideal to support these families with biogas technologies by installing biogas digesters to enable them meet their household energy requirements. The technology is already available in Tanzania, Kenya, and in Malawi. Reforestation initiatives. Deforestation has taken a place, has taken place and abated in Malawi for a long time. This has resulted in severe deforestation and environmental degradation. Some efforts are being made at community level to rehabilitate hill slopes, river banks, as well as establishment of food loss. There's an energy of called total land care, which is taking this initiative. And as an incentive to the community, they distribute goals, and when these goals are produced, one family pass it on to another, and then it goes around the community. This is basically to empower them to, with uh, economic uh, resources so that they can, their livelihood is sustained. Food tree growing in another dimension, communities are geared to plant, drafted, and valid fruit trees in order to advance household nutrition, household incomes, Hopefully, some industry will also emerge to process the resultant foods into food juices and in the process improve household income. Women empowerment. It is a known fact that empowering women goes a long way, supporting the entire family in the form of nutrition, family incomes, gender well-being, as well as children's education. In some parts of the world, education, you have to pay for it. High schools, for example. In other, in other developed countries, I'm sure education, the children goes to state schools, but it's no longer the case in other parts of the world. Women, in most communities are already organized in two groups. And such groups could be used as a platform for the various demand-driven economic empowerment initiatives. Having said that, this could include supporting them to access loans, support them to access uh, markets, for their agricultural produce. It's unfortunate that women, especially in sub Saharan countries, they constitute a bigger percentage in terms of production, like working in fields, in gardens. But because they don't have access to markets which can give them a premium prices, they have hard work, hard work uh, yields which they have earned, they end up in the hands of middlemen. And these are the people who get the premium price. And I view this as a bit unfair. So in forums like this, I think it's a good platform where we can share and brainstorm and direct and lead each other how these are social enterprise can be of high beneficial to the beneficiaries. Uh, there are efforts being made. These efforts are actually progress would be made towards contributing to uh, gender pay gap. A recent research and collaborations in some forums clearly shows that by not closing the gender pay gap, there are various worldwide economic consequences. 
In fact, according to Mackenzie Global Institute of Board, advancing the quality of art about the United States 12 million, 12 trillion dollars program in just two years. If these gaps can be closed and we attain equality. After having said that, I attended one of the primary sessions yesterday, not yesterday or the day before yesterday. The projection is that it will take about a session for this gap to close. It is clear that some progress has been made. Almost a quarter of a billion more women in the workforce today than a day ago. In many countries, more women are graduating from university than men. In the case of Malawi, about 600,000 girls have been recalled from early marriage and get them back into school. Yet, despite all this, it was said that the findings of the latest group gender gap report are a bit disappointing. Across health, education, economic opportunity, gender gap has closed by only 4% in the past 10 years. The economic gap has closed just by 3%. And the progress at this same rate, it will take a significant number of years for gender gap to be in favor of women. These are the most challenges we are trying to fight when we are attending these forums. When we look at Africa, the picture is even more disconcerting. Although growth, although growth rose to six percent last year, the United Nations Development Program (UNDP) has reported a sixty-one percent loss in development due to gender inequality. What does that speak say? This illustrates clearly that more than 50% of African population is not being used optionally. We could draw some assumptions that a bigger percentage of us of women, and I'm sure this scenario would be also uh, there in other parts of the world. Therefore, everybody is welcome aboard to take active steps so that no one is left behind. Finally, we should embrace the culture of accountability and transparency. Those of us, those who are the recipients, so that the donor agency, the ones who is given, should have trust and be encouraged that the yields are actually moving from the lower level to the higher level. If these remarks I think I can sit down. Thank you. Um, thank you, Evelyn. And now may I introduce our next speaker, Vijay Lakshmiji. She is the founder, secretary, and trustee of Heritage India. Please welcome me. I'd like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Rupa Vasudevan, for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts on giving, philanthropy, and uh, social enterprise. At first, I'd like to speak about 
the art of giving. Our country has always instilled this idea of giving. If you look at traditional homes, it always had a veranda in front. And this was meant for weary travelers to rest. And if they happened to be there at the time that a meal was served, they got the meal. Then there were dharmashalas, which was for people who did not have enough uh, income and they needed food. And then the temples were of course a haven for people without uh, resources. And then we had the temples supported uh, scholars and uh, dancers too. And the large lands that belonged to temples were given to farmers to cultivate with no fee paid. And the only condition was that they would have to share a part of it to the temple once again to feed people. So this has been sort of embedded in us. But I'm sure you all know, you know, for a thousand years what has happened in this country. We have had invasion on invasion and then uh, people came into colony, uh, you know, to trade and then they just took over and uh, it's just been 70 years since we have, you know, our aggressors have left the borders of this country but the trauma of what they did, we are still suffering. I mean, when you look at the newspaper every day, you know what happens in wherever we have been divided. But having said that, I'd still like to say that we've done pretty well for ourselves and you know, there is a gradual change and we are moving again towards this concept of giving. Uh, Swami Dayananda Saraswati, who's, um, my, who's my guru and I had the good fortune of being with him, said that the soul of Hinduism or that is what uh, the way of life here, which was called Sanatana Dharma is called now, is giving. It's being a contributor and not just a consumer. And there is something called Purta Karma. Purta Karma means fulfilling action. Everybody knows the word Karma. We know it in negative ways, we know it in positive ways and you know, and people can use it in a very negative manner also and you know, just sit back and say, oh what can I do, this is my Karma. But Purta Karma is not this inactive. Actually, karma means action. And purta means fulfilling. And when they say purta karma, our shastras say that if you do purta karma, you accumulate good deeds. And purta karma means fulfilling action. And the fulfillment is not self-fulfillment, but it's a fulfillment of a need for the larger good of society. And when you do an act of purta karma, the satisfaction that you get from that is immediate because you see the results. And Purta Karma is one way of building our own self-confidence. And it's a certain uh, attitude that we start developing of giving because the result is something that you see and the only result is of having fulfilled a need for the larger good of society. But when you do Purta Karma, they are very clear in talking about the attitude of giving. There is an attitude in giving. It's called Shraddhaya Dev. That is, you give with a sense of Shraddha. Faith. Faith. Uh, it's not really faith, but, uh, well, I mean, English language being what it is, Shraddha. And then they say, do not give with pride. Ashraddaya Adeya. So do not give it pride. Then they say, give with all the wealth you have. Shri Adeya. But then they say, give with the fear that what you give may not be accepted. So Swami Vivekananda says that when you give, the giver and the receiver are both equally blessed. So there is nothing called pride that should come into this act of giving. And now if I say that we have to give, I mean it's all fine to say we have to give, we have to... But to want to give, what is it you need? You need empathy and you need compassion. And so I am going to speak from a very different angle about a social enterprise that we run 
which is a totally not-for-profit organization. So I really don't know what I'm doing in a women's economic forum. Because now when you say economy, it's all to do with the exchange of money moving from hand to hand. But I think intangible wealth goes way more than tangible wealth. And so somewhere in the 1994s, um, we suddenly saw, I come from Bangalore, which was a very laid back, soft, gentle town which had a lot of scope for the age and the children and the elderly felt it was a very nice place. But come the 90s, suddenly things started changing. On the one side people were saying, yeah, there's development. But when we started looking, life was changing at an alarming pace. There's something called slowness, slowness in life. I don't know if any of you have heard of the slow movement. The slow movement is a movement where people have realized that in this fast pace of life, you stop being connected to people. It's not just to people, it's just to anything. Even for example, a meal. You're really not connected to your food because you have your cell phone on one side, you have an iPad somewhere else, and then you have somebody else telling you something else, and there's no connection even to your food. Forget about having connection to the person sitting across the table. I mean, I often go to a hotel and then you see four people sitting at a table. Everybody is WhatsApping someone who is not present. There is no connection to people. So they started what was called the slow movement, where people wanted to actually connect. Now you rarely connect. I mean, there is this wonderful media called, I mean, you can use it for good things, but it can also be a very negative thing called Facebook, where you are connected with everybody who is not present, while the people who are present are just not there. So we looked around and we said, well, we want to do something about this, but what do we do? And then we noticed one thing, that raising funds for community had started becoming more and more difficult. The traditional and classical arts were losing audience, losing ground, and uh, we didn't know what to do about it. We sat down, we said, well, we want to do something, but what do we have to do? So then we said, well, if we want giving to happen, then we need empathy. We need compassion. So we said, how are we going to bring back the sense of compassion and empathy into society? And then we started thinking, well, art is a very important portion in society. People imagine that, oh, art is for the stomach that's full. But that's not true, really. I mean, when I say the stomach that's full, I mean somebody who's satisfied. But even to have that sense of satisfaction, you need heart. And if you need heart, you need art. So we said, well, let's address this one issue in society which is kind of moving away because people are too busy with anything. So we said, okay, let's start bringing art into society. And then we thought, now, how do we do this? There are so many performances that happen. With, uh, you know, you have to beg for audience to come. Like I thought at the beginning that, oh my God, now we don't have anybody here. I said, well, if there are four people, it's good. I mean, four people are actually going to listen to you. But I'm sure somebody stood out there and said, come on, come on, come to the session. I know this happens in conferences, especially when it's parallel sessions. But that's okay. So we said, okay, we have to do something about this. So <coughs> several of us deliberated and we had a lot of conversation and then finally we said, let's do a festival. Let's do a celebration. Because, you know, otherwise what happens is we all tend to sit down and discuss everything that's negative. I mean, where there's negative, there is positive too. You open the newspaper in the morning, it's like, oh God, why did I wake up today? Because everything is bad. You turn on the news channel, it's the same thing. So we said, well, why don't we do something that's celebrating? Let's celebrate. It doesn't matter. I mean, if your stomach is empty, you celebrate, your heart gets full. 
So we said, let's try this. Meanwhile, things changed a little. Where there were community needs that were tangible, people actually started giving. But this giving was not out of the goodness of their heart, but because there was this new thing called CSR, you know, which is kind of like, you better give it, you know, your company needs something, you better give CSR. And I've seen some companies where they give CSR, they don't even know why they're giving, what they're giving, there's no involvement there. Because when giving, you need to be a part of that giving. You need to actually give of yourself. So we started this, uh, we run two festivals actually. And besides the two festivals, we also do uh, some tangible work of feeding, uh, you know, about 100 uh, rural children. We have our own little family trust from which we uh, make hot meals for this little school. That's uh, semi-rural, semi-urban. It's not really urban, but it's rural on the outskirts of Bangalore. We also do other things other than just the meal. We have some welfare programs for the village. But then we said we have to somewhere fill this lacuna where the person on this fast track at least has a small space of slowness in their lives. Now we are disconnected from our heritage, we are disconnected from, from our culture, we are disconnected from our language. I mean, it's, it's just disconnect, disconnect and more disconnect. And we've lost our cultural roots. And more often than not, you know, I have seen some youngsters who, you know, nothing wrong with the youngster. It's, it's probably what, what they have seen, what they've come down with, who have no clue of who they are. This happens more in the metros, not in the smaller towns. And so we said, okay, let's choose heritage spaces. We said, let's take old temples, you know, which are over 400 years old. There aren't too many in Bangalore, but there are some. We said, let's do our programs in the temples. And so we said, okay. And then, of course, you know, when you say social enterprise, we have to have a little complaining that we have to do. Uh, unfortunately, in India, temples that are uh, over 300, 400 years old all come under this department called the endowment department. So the government has taken over those temples. So now we need to get permission. I thought temples were public spaces for everybody to use, but uh, well, so you give a letter in uh, July and then you'll have to go and follow it up. And in fact, once I joked, I said, why don't you give me a job in this department? If you want me to keep moving the file from table to table, I might as well work here. So anyway, that's, that's a little bit of a damper sometimes. But uh, so we choose temple spaces. And then we thought this way they connect to history. So we do a lot of work on the history of the temple and we put it out there on display. And we bring over 100 to 100. Okay, anyway, the, fun, the festival runs from the third week of January, about six to eight weekends. This is a time when the rain gods you know, take it off in Bangalore so we can still work outside in open spaces, we don't have to have the worry of rains. So the venues are all open spaces under the trees, and so we create an ambience where slowness could happen. Maybe people will stop looking at their cell phones at that time, hopefully. And uh, so we do it under the trees, and so we brought this little bit of connect to history. And to these spaces, which are very peaceful, and then we bring about 100 to 150 artists over these uh, eight weekends from across, across the country to perform. And all our traditional arts, the content of the art is absolutely spiritual. So that brings your next connect. And the art itself is very soothing and quietening. So it's our hope that that may create some sympathy and empathy. Because in fact, I think it's the Waldorf University that has conducted a series of researches and they say that a community that is exposed to classical art, they need not be playing the instrument or singing themselves. So even that exposure 
they say creates more empathy, there is more feeling of community and more identification to their own countries in a positive manner. So that's the next thing we think we are hoping to achieve. And the next thing we do is we have a theme every year. We have done sacred trees, we have done sacred animals. All our themes are based on our natural heritage. Because somewhere when people say, oh heritage, it, they think it's just that you, you know, you wear some fancy clothes and you go and move your arms and feet and you know, you become very cultured. And you know, you know all about your country. But a very important aspect of our country is our natural heritage. If you look at any of our heritage literature, it has, you know, even if you read a poem, the whole description of the environment and ecology is there. So we take a theme. And when I say we take a theme, what we do is, when we say sacred trees, we put up a lot of posters. And when we write about the tree, it's from our heritage literature and also from contemporary knowledge. Whatever there is, you know, we, we put it up there. And so we are trying to bring about a small amount of consciousness and awareness about the importance of environment and ecology. We also plant trees wherever there is enough place, you know, wherever the temple is, if there's enough space, we also plant. And I guess now in the past seven years, we have filled up those spaces in all the temples. And, you know, now it's, it's just become that we gift saplings, every artist, we don't make any mementos. The mementos are saplings with details on the saplings. And the next thing we do is we've now started bringing scientists and uh, scholars to speak on whatever our theme is. You know, I was amazed. We, one year our uh, theme was uh, sacred animals. And I was quite amazed that in Karnataka alone there are 17 fish sanctuaries that are maintained by temples and ashrams. I said, wow, I didn't even know there was something called fish sanctuaries. And now to know that you know they are maintained and you know kept well, I was really I was really pretty happy. I said, okay, this has really been a part of our culture. And uh, the next thing is, since our performances are in temple venues, the audience is a cross section. If you go to a theater for a performance, you rarely see little children there. And there is a connoisseur of art who goes there, not the general person of the street. Here you have a complete cross-section, right from the elderly to the littlest ones. And it's such a joy to see these little children sitting in the front. And you know, while the person is playing the musical instrument, their fingers are also moving, or if they're dancing, they're also dancing. And you know, they're imbibing what is there. And the art that is being given is several thousands of years old. Because our Nati Shastra is at least five or six thousand years old. And it's amazing to see that, you know, that thread of culture has been kept intact. And so that's the next thing that happens. And then we run a short six question quiz. One is based on the performance, one is based on our theme, and the other is based on the temple history. When we say temple history, it's not necessarily only the temple, but maybe the person who built the temple. Had he been a you know famous king or famous personality or whoever? So most more more often than not, it's the little ones who answer those questions. I mean that's because they are the ones who actually pay attention. The others are busy looking at their cell phones. Or you know, mind is still running around. So this is what we have tried to bring to the people because we feel that if we have to have a society that wants to give, empathy is a very important thing. Unless you have that empathy, giving doesn't happen. And we run another festival called Srishti Sankrama or the Earth Festival, which also follows the same theme. And uh, it uh, is run in, a, in, a, in an institution. <laughs> so the people that are addressed are college students. So we have a photography exhibition and whatever the topic is, we bring both from the contemporary view and from our heritage literature. You'll be surprised to see what an amount of uh, knowledge there is in our heritage literature. It's, it's just amazing. And, uh, and then we also plant uh, a thousand trees in the Green Belt area. 
And uh, the past uh, year, we have had a lot of support from uh, Dr. Rupa Vasudevan's institution. And uh, when I said we take a theme, we had a really nice theme this year. It was uh, sacred flowers. And we said, let's trace um, flowers and flowering plants that were in our country for a few thousand years. And so we said, let's take flowers from the Ramayana. You'll be amazed to see that in our literature works, there is so much detailing of geography of the flora, the fauna, the rivers, the mountains. So it was quite a job, but uh, we had the cooperation of the right at university to do that for us. So we put up in each, and then, you know, it's called a self flagellation So we couldn't just do one theme for the whole festival, so each venue had different themes. So we said flowers from Mahabharata, flowers from Ramayana, flowers from Ayurveda, flowers from uh, literature, flowers that are used for uh, puja. So we had to look through several hundred uh, verses. And um, what impressed me is that at first, when we did it the first year, we had taken so much of effort to put these displays up and then we said, Oh, you know, we have this attitude, oh, the temple goer. I don't know whether they're going to be bothered with all this. But it's quite amazing that they stand there. More often than not, sometimes they may not sit down for the performance, but they're sitting there reading all this material. And now they've started taking pictures. And then they keep asking us, oh, do you have a book? I said, well, you know, when we have enough funding, we'll have a book too. And as to funding, I must tell you that we really have not had such a major problem. Of course, if we had more, we'd do better. But uh, we've uh, found a group of people who are as passionate about what we do. And so every year that I make this phone call, you know, in say October, because the festival starts in January, and I just ask, so when can I come by and meet you? They say, no, no, don't worry, you don't have to come. And you know, in a week or two, they would have sent a check. And so we've really not had such a major problem with the funding. But of course, if we had more funding, instead of calling only two big artists, we may have called five big artists. And so this is what we have been trying to do as a social enterprise, trying to see that the art of giving and philanthropy is done with greater willingness and with the correct attitude. So, with these few words, I think I have said more than If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I will try to answer if I have. So, the floor is open for questions. Any questions from the audience? I don't have questions, uh, but uh, it's okay. Hmm? Uh, I don't have question. I just want to bring uh, to the notice of Madam. Uh, <coughs> I am from Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. We have uh, many social groups working uh, into this particular philanthropy kind of thing. Uh, see, they are uh, blood groups, blood donation groups, and I am uh, associated with three of uh, that kind of group. We are actually providing medicines and we are uh, providing uh, monetary help. We are providing blood whenever required. Just one message that you need O positive, A positive, and the person is there in the hospital. Within no time, within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and nothing expected back. And um, uh, there are uh, uh, many group, uh, young, uh, youngsters are running group. Uh, they are uh, educating children. Every Sunday they are educating. Every Sunday they are uh, going in for sports and free education and uh, overall inner development of the uh, underprivileged uh, children and they are doing well. I mean, uh, in Bhopal uh, city, uh, you can, uh, I have uh, seen the change within a span of five years, people are more into philanthropy. 
uh, previously it was like uh, running an NGO is for funding, but now it is not there. People are actually want to do something good. Even I am involved with that plantation saplings. Uh, you know, as you said, uh, distribution of saplings. Now it has become a theme in the <coughs> college as well. If you go for a seminar, they give you a plant, tulsi plant, as a, a momento. They don't give you momento. They give you a tulsi plant. Things are changing. Uh, Ma'am, um, I'm totally with you and I'm actually doing a bit of my part as well. Thank you so much. Is there some But I was particularly interested about the flowers uh, the collection of knowledge that you would have uh, made it on Srishti, the, you know, the heritage. Yes, plant. yes, yes we do. In fact, uh, the Lighthead University is planning on creating a small uh, museum with uh, all this information and the flowers. Okay. okay. So is it available? I would do it. This is Bangalore? I mean, which, which? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Maybe you could write to her. Huh? Maybe you could write to her and start a dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course. Uh, uh, you can, uh, yeah, because I'm working details. on certain books and you know, some of your knowledge better. Yeah, so yeah sure. You can share your knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can. Yeah, sure. It's Vijay Lakshmi, V I J A Y A L K S H M I. That's it. Dot Vijay Kumar. Ah, okay. At gmail.com. So we can uh, continue keep in touch. touch. Yeah, you can keep in touch and keep in touch if you have it. It's possible for me to answer yeah, and yeah. otherwise mm -hmm. I'll put you in somebody else, still in touch with somebody who can. You know, it's amazing work, especially with our in the campus. Yeah, we are very happy about that. Just because my name is spelled actually Any more questions? Like slow foods, you were a slow movement, you were talking slow foods come, comes into that, isn't it? Yeah. In Mumbai, we have uh, that. The young people are very active with that. I have a question for the lady from Malawi. Uh, you mentioned about helping the economically uh, weaker segments by giving them opportunity to uh, grow every year. What I want to know is, have you been able to track their progress and quantify the growth that is happening because of your assistance and support? Uh, do you see a 5% growth every year, 10% growth? I mean, uh, what are the uh, results of the cooperation that you are extending to these uh, groups? It's a very good question. Uh, the thing is, uh, the NGO has just started after realizing that there are those gaps and loops. Now, this will be our first season. And in fact, my main reason of coming to India is to try to establish a relationship with the buyers of pigeon peas. Malawi, technically, grows a lot of tobacco, very tobacco. Seventy percent of the income is from tobacco. Is from tobacco. And with the anti-smoking lobby, everybody is aware of that. So we are out of money. Therefore, what do we do? The discretion is the way forward. Now, why we're working with these women groups is because these are the people who are effectively affected with the growing of tobacco in the gardens. I would say that in terms of quantities, more than more than 200,000 metric tons of pigeon peas, which is processed into the, I'm sure you, will, you know what I'm talking about, lands in my mind. But who are the initial producers? Who are the people who sweat in the gardens? It is this woman. So he said, ah, something, somewhere is not right. So we are trying to cut the middleman. And I'm, I'm privileged to meet with the, I'm just forgetting the name, 
the gentleman who was talking about energy was on the previous session. It was a team of investors who visited Malawi during the Malawi investment uh, forum. So I will be working with the key stakeholders who identify the markets and all big uh, will be exporting between the season starts in June, July, and August. <coughs> in terms of quantities, we are expecting to export very close to 100,000 metric tons, but we require support because we need uh, logistics uh, issues like uh, uh, putting them on the on the ship, uh, on the trucks to buy that, as we know that Malawi is a landlocked country. Therefore, we have to transport these goods to Baila and then put them on the ship. To, we still have some homework to do, but we have started the initiative. I don't know whether I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, just to add on top of, uh, just to add on top of the uh, helping out the, the underprivileged, uh, we have an entrepreneur, a very young lady, who makes uh, dresses. She's a designer. And this dress I'm wearing was made by her team who are disabled. So those are the sounds of the people Thank you very much. It was a wonderful audience, a very stable audience, willing to listen, willing to contribute and we have really enjoyed this session. I have to also thank Mama, I can't pronounce the name, for expounding further on the uh, social enterprise that is happening in India and tracing back to the, uh, your culture heritage. It was a wonderful moment for me and an honor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, questions? No, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. The group, it's okay. You have time? Yeah, we can. Okay, a little more about Madam Vijaya Shruti. I know her for about two years now. She is a pilot by profession. I don't know whether they said that in the introduction. Uh, pilot. She stopped flying because uh, she found it. Um, uh, She's, she's the first woman who went cross country. She's the first woman. <laughs> and besides all her achievements as a philanthropist, in the true sense of philanthropy, she's a, and she's a great leader, she's a great grandmother, she's a great family woman, and uh, I'm totally in awe of her. That's it. Thank you. I have a lot of hidden traits. It was nice to have you all here. It was a wonderful session. And as they say, it is the art of giving. And the art of giving lies in all of us. So let's practice it more and uh, make India a better place. So now we just have a group photograph session. Please come. Thank you.